um, framework uh, from if you're interested in facilitating Joanna Macy's work. I think Marty, you were interested yeah, in that. I was. And uh, I sent it to you, Linda, maybe I should post it here somewhere. Yes, can you, do you see the, uh, the notepad next to the screen? Yeah, I do. Uh, yeah, it says table, main table. Main table, if you could post it there, that way those notes stay with this particular oh, meeting so we can Okay, I will post that. it. <clears throat> and uh, in fact, it's posted right now. Block plugin. We'll forget that right now. Now I'm not seeing it. Are you putting it on the chat box or in the uh, main table? Uh, um, I, let, let me do that later, and I'll, I'll finish up here and get out. It's suddenly frozen. Uh, okay. So uh, we plan to add more to uh, the Macy work, and I know uh, Marty, you're interested in that, and uh, because um, it needs more brain work, uh, more uh, analytical content to um, complement the behavioral experiential material. And uh, we're using <clears throat> uh, interpersonal neurobiology by Daniel Siegel. Oh, yeah. As a wonderful way to, uh, to enrich uh, the conversation. And particularly the tool called the Wheel of Awareness he has a wonderful tool, uh, the Wheel of Awareness, and uh, we're going to try that. And last last month, um, Rosa and I and John and Richard Lent had a discussion about uh, Will, McKin Will McQuinney's work on paths of change. And so that's a way of taking into account the worldview of participants, the different worldviews of participants, and designing then a process of change that includes those world those worldviews. And that has been uh, <clears throat> seconded by uh, the work done at, at the uh, Open University in the UK. And uh, there they have a book on Communities of practice. Communities of practice. If I can find it. Uh, which argues that uh, you have to um, take into account world, different worldviews, and there are ways of doing it that they propose. And I, I can't find my guide. But, uh, and then finally, uh, I'm working on a guide to. How to Learn uh, System Theories, and which books really, really help you there. The multiple, multiple system theories. So that's my report. Wow. So I kind of took a few notes, but why don't you fill in? Because I couldn't get it. I will. Yeah. Maybe you want to say a little bit more about your book on systems theory, or do you, should we do that after we all check in? Yeah, why don't we do that afterwards? Wow. Well, who would like to go next? Linda, can I make a, a I just ask a question. Sure. So what is the format here? Because having skipped a, a month, I don't know. Like you're, you're saying, you know, what Jim gave us is a, is a great report, but I didn't prepare a report. And um, <laughs> so... I'm not sure what we're doing. I guess is really what I'm saying. So well, we're what all, is we don't really have a structure, and we just we basically check in in the beginning, and usually that leads into into a dialogue based on what we're doing or based on our check in. So no, I I don't have anything prepared either. Um, Jim is always you're always up to so many things, and he, you offer so many resources. So we don't expect anyone to follow Jim with exactly what he oh, does. Oh, how nice! do you, you you bring in so many amazing resources so it's really just whatever you're doing Sarah whatever you think you'd like to 
you know, what, whatever's working you, whatever questions you might want to put into a dialogue to start some kind of dialogue. Um, just what's on the top of the list, you know, for you. What are you working with that might be of interest or that we could help with? Okay, well, that's a lot of questions. That, that's, that's sort of different. Um, what do we want to help each other with? What are we excited about what we're doing? And um, yes, I, what I also like when people convene is just to say, how are you? Yeah, basically, <laughs> how are you? Yeah. I like a check-in that's yeah. a little bit like, how the heck are you these right. days? Down. Um, and I, I think one of the things that's very funny, I'll just say, is that having been on the board at the Public Conversations Project when it was that for so many years, their own process lacked all dialogic awareness. I mean, of I'll just course. say that out front and, you know, I'd say it to them too. And I worked on it the whole time I was there. So I, I encourage that among ourselves. Thank you for the reminder because I didn't give any guidance at all today. Um, and I wasn't even, I wasn't even trying to take the facilitator role necessarily. I just, yeah. So thank you. It's all about relationships. Sure. It's, it's funny because if we can't do it with each other, I mean, I, I actually physically can't stand it when a circle doesn't start by going around the circle and just say, how are you? And, you know, say something about, um, you know, what's, what are you letting go of? Or, you know, just, yeah, what's on your mind? Anything. It's almost like I physically can't stand it. Anyway, welcome to who's, who's just come in. Uh, Jim, why don't we just start with you? How are you doing, just on a personal level? And we'll just go around on that level. And... I'm doing swell. <laughs> Anything else you want to share on that level? Uh, I just got a picture of my granddaughter and I and an alien. Oh. And there was a book called Incident at Exeter, and we celebrate the arrival of an alien 25 years ago, wow. thanks to the Kiwanis Club. And I just got a picture of me and the alien and my granddaughter. Wow. <laughs> wow. That kills everything. <laughs> we want to know more about the alien, of course. I will send you the picture, right? Give me a little time, I'll send it to you. Okay, fair enough. You could bring it up on your screen. Yeah, I can. Okay. On the share screen, down on the bottom, little green thing says share screen. Oh, share screen, okay. That'll share your computer screen, and we'll see all the stuff you're up to. Oh, so my gosh. You're up first. Oh, no. <laughs> Hi, Nancy. Hi, Linda. Hi, everybody. Hi. I don't think, Nancy, you know uh, Sarah Bowie or Sarah, I'm not sure you know Nancy Black Brunei. No, I'd like to know her because I love the things she was saying just as I finally got online. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, yeah, totally. Yeah, I just totally forgot any kind of facilitative. Oh, my God. We're going to have to fire you, girl. Oh. <laughs> Nancy, you should go next, because if, if we do the circle. I would rather not okay. go, pass and come back, because I feel like I'm just barely getting, I got in, I'm sorry to say, a little bit late. So give no me a problem. little bit of time. Thank you, Sarah. Well, I'll go. We can go the other way. Um, I guess that's why I was a, a little bit abrupt, because I was sitting in traffic, and I was listening to this uh, kind of frightening report on the radio that somebody, some doctor got pulled off. United Air. It was really bizarre. I, I, I just, it was so shocking that I didn't know what to make of it. Ugh. Um, well, how have I been? Um, I feel a bit distracted and unfocused in my life right now. Um, I made a tough decision to get off this uh, city climate change committee. It was undergoing uh, reorganization and it just looked like they were downsizing it to the point where they were merging another group and the group I had been in and there had been if you put the two groups together there would have been maybe 25 to 30 people so they downsized us to 11 people I could have stayed on but I felt like they expanded the scope and downsized the um, number of people on it and it had been really um, 
kind of a do nothing committee. I mean, not that there wasn't a lot to do, but it hadn't been organized. So I finally just decided I'd be more effective offering myself as a facilitator and not to be actually showing up every month. So that, that's actually a great relief to me that I'm out of it and kind of on the outside. And, and the fellow that I offered my facilitation to was quite happy and he, you know, they might do that. So that, that would give me more satisfaction to work at that level. Um, and I, you know, I, as far as my climate change work goes, I'm still doing some of the volunteer things that I had been doing. Um, and one of them is still going very well, this uh, Architecture 2030. I think you all know about that, right? I don't have to just explain what that is. It's, a, it's an effort to get our largest building sector in Tucson to become more energy efficient. And I'm loving working with the people. There are a bunch of uh, architects and um, systems people who know about energy efficiency. And I'm just, I'm loving learning about it. I'm taking even a college class that the EPA is putting on that we're actually facilitating. And it's bringing us together in community. And that's one of the, the cooler things I'm doing. I, um, I'm loving this uh, community dialogue group that I started in January. Uh, we don't talk that much about climate change, but we do talk a lot about the political situation we're in, and it, it feeds me. I'm learning so much just putting our heads together um, about why, you know, why we seem to be going down this very anarchic, anarchic kind of past, or almost like a regressive path, um, based on some of the underpinnings of our constitution. So that's been interesting to me. But in general, I'm feeling a little bit less focused than I've been and wondering if and when or how I could really do anything with respect to climate change. I am putting solar on my house. I feel good about that. Um, that's kind of where I've been last month, kind of sitting around looking for opportunities. I've been busy, but I, I don't feel like I'm really on this direct path anywhere. Oh, but we are having, uh, do you know, uh, let's see, Catherine Hayhoe, have you all heard of her? Yeah, she's wonderful. She's coming to Tucson, uh, and I have an opportunity to see her two times, one in a private setting where she's working with people from CCL, and then in the evening we're all just attend a conference. So I love her. She's great. I saw her at the, at the um, Parliament of World Religions a couple years ago. She's great. That's me. Should I go next? Sure. Okay. Um, yeah. Well, I I'm plugging away. I you know I have um, a couple of big projects that just can kind of constantly need my attention. So I feel very lucky that the forms are there and and actually. Um, the work is so often very gratifying. Unfortunately, I'm at the point where I really need money for both of them. <laughs> and so one of them is, is a curriculum initiative at Clark where we're, we're basically calling it a New Earth community. And it is a way in which we're, um, we're going to be creating new kinds of educational experiences for students. Um, to, to have uh, a much more dialogic experience um, based on counsel, this, this practice of reflection together that's obviously part of our work. <clears throat> and, um, and then turning to a variety of concerns and issues from the base of reflection on what's taking place in the biggest possible way. But anyway, we're, we're seeking a, an outside funder and foundation funding. And so I'm working on various angles on that. And then I'm continuing to convene councils on the uncertain human future. Um, and just in the process of getting some additional funding for three new ones that are coming up, one of them is going to be in Kathmandu um, that's been convened by... Uh, a dear friend, but also colleague who's uh, on the staff at USAID, but she's brought together Nepalese, Tibetans, and expats who are all concerned about climate change. And so we're, we're doing our, our process of meeting in council in June, and then they will have a follow-up session or two. And then they are so eager to get going into action that they can 
barely contain themselves long enough to wait and have the process of reflection together. Um, and so it's exciting, and I can't wait to get there and do that with them. Um, and then I have two other groups, one in Santa Fe and one in uh, New Hampshire that are coming up. Um, and then a number of other incipient ones and another one coming here at Clark. So that practice, which I think I've shared at least the, con you know, the basic stuff on the website, um, is what I'm up to and it just sustains me because it always feels as though we're able to go right to what's on our minds, whether it's on the political situation, on our frustrations about what we can do or not do, on visioning what we can do together now. Um, it's an arc of activities, but it has recently started in the ones that I've been doing now with, with accepting the fact that we've been altered by the political situation that we're in and that it has really limited us and and we're not sure what that means and and how to address it and and people are obviously innervated i mean it's there's so much draining of energy that's gone on so um that's that's enough for now yeah sarah what is your website please it is Council on the Uncertain Human Future dot org. That's one of them. That's the council one. And the other one is New Earth Conversation dot org. Newer? Is it newer? New, new Earth. New Earth. Yeah. New Earth Conversation dot org. Phenomenal. Thank you so much. <clears throat> Can you tell us something about the New Hampshire event? Is that open? Actually, that's a Buddhist community, the oh. Natural Dharma Fellowship. And so it's going to be a launching of, of it within an invited group. And we are, but we are going to start them practicing it more widely. So people will be considering it a time of both doing the council and getting some training in being able to facilitate the councils. Thank you. I didn't hear Jim's question, so I wasn't sure what your answer was to. He was asking if it was open. Um, Which, if what was open, that's the part of New it. Hampshire. Council, the council in New Hampshire. Got it. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I wish you were doing one out here, out in the West. I would love to actually sit through one. That would be most wonderful. Well, we should talk about it, Linda, and figure it out. I mean, I'd be happy to do one for you know, whatever group we decide. The problem is it should be done in person. Yeah, no, I, I appreciate that. Yeah, let's talk about that. Because I see okay. you going in different directions. Maybe this would be something that would be um, really wonderful to sponsor here. Great. Marty, or would you like to check in? So I can, should I go next? This is sure. Marty. Yeah. Okay. Um, before I start, I, I don't know that I should write it down, but um, Sarah, I, if I understood you correctly, you said that you were starting, you were seeking a grant to do something in terms of more dialogic experiential approaches with students. Um, is that correct? Well, it is, but we need about $1.5 million. So it's, it's a big, big program that has many different parts to it. Okay, I was just interested in that, because, and that kind of was an intro into my update, because um, one of my happy places is my daughter, who's a professor at University of Northern Colorado, who's a, a young professor, but a very participatory professor in her culture. She teaches uh, poli-sci and international studies, and I get the um, pleasure of being uh, mentor, advisor, sounding board to her in many dimensions of her publishing and research and teaching. So I'm always looking for things to share with her. So I didn't know if there was anything that I could send her to, any place I could send her to in terms of dialogic teaching. We can talk more, Marty, because I have a lot of stuff on that. I can send you a book that we did about dialogic teaching at Clark. Okay, that would be great. And I'll post it on that thing if I can figure it out. Okay, that's great. So, so um, 
I'm doing much better uh, than when we talked a few months ago. I know that I'm finally back somewhat centered and feeling like myself a little bit. I almost feel like I'm not supposed to say this because it's still so sh shitty and awful what's happening in the world with, with Trump coming in. But I mean, we were all knocked off so much. And as I reflect back on the last few months, you know, I was, I had like five symptoms over the holidays. It's my happiest time of year when my kids come home with their significant others. And I usually cordon that space off in my life. Nothing can touch it. You know, in this last year, I was, I was having stomach issues. Um, I, I broke out in some type of a rash. I had, I just had like six symptoms going on that made me really uneasy the whole time. And I, I swear the only thing I can pin this to is I was just totally unglued from my grounding of, you know, how do I proceed? What do we do? So I, I'm feeling much better. I made some big decisions in terms of my climate work. I poured so much of my time into political action the last four years through Citizens Climate Lobby, and I continue to work with them, but I'm mainly leading a national environmental justice team now. Um, and I'm stepping back from being a liaison to a congressperson, Congressman Jerry Lerny, and I'm also stepping back from leading a chapter. So these have been huge commitments, um, and I feel this opening in my life, which has um, of course, it opened me up to do more things, and I, I maybe we'll talk a little bit later about um, some of that. I mean, I'm, I see myself moving into some new roles uh, for my work, um, but I'm really, I've been able to get a little more in balance with health again and start to feel like I have, I've kind of limited my social, me my media doses of news. I just, I just feel like I've kind of reached, I think, without losing my anger or my desire to stay very active and to connect with others, I think I found a way to live right now. It could change next week, but I'm feeling like I think I found a way to live with this new reality. Um, so, so I'm in a feeling good space right now. That's all I'll say right now. That's great. Thanks, Marty. Nancy, are you ready? I am indeed. Thanks to you all. Oh, what a great group. Thank you. You know, Marty, what you were describing, I've had this feeling from, at least from November on, of being part of this organism that I, I can feel sensations, thoughts, images in myself and find them all around me. And then in a week or two, they shift. And a week or two later, they shift again. And to the point that I like know kind of not only where I'm going to be at, but where the people around me seem to be at, as if we're going through all of this in some larger emotional sense deeply together. And I was expecting that this month people would be from just massively coming out in um, the Santa Cruz is not that big a city for what, 50,000 people. And within a very short time, the indivisible folks, and there were two or three groups that started simultaneously in between them, they, they had two to 3,000 people, almost none of whom were previously active in our community. And with all the intensity that went with that, and it's now starting to settle out. People are you know, getting themselves organized into smaller groups, trust circles, stepping back, sorting out how to get their balance back, how to get their health back. And they're not dropping out or pulling back. They're just kind of really settling into that part of the work that best suits them with the people that they work best with. And I think most of us are both connected to our longstanding work, skills, talents, and joys, and also new ways of doing it. And I know I'm in a process, very conscious process right now, of having both taken on a whole bunch of new things and, and thinking through of those, which do I really belong in? What's emerging for me? So I was just really resonating with all of that. To be more specific, um, I, 
I think I, I'm very close to having finalized a decision. Um, I'm just in the midst this week of writing it all up to start a small organ, what would initially at least and maybe permanently be a small organization, partly just to give me structure and grounding for what I'm doing it, doing, and I'm calling it CART, which is Latin for MAP, and it stands for Citizen Action Research Teaching, and excuse me, re Action Research and Teaching Exchange. And I have a website that is just up in absolutely skeletal form at, um, I'll, I'll put it in the thing, I can tell it to you, it's higheredge.co. And I, in it, I will, I'm putting together a map of all of the main kinds of solutions to the main challenges we're up against. I, the phrase I had been using for it for my writing, and if I do end up with a, doing a book out of this, I would probably still stay with the title, the, the World We Need and How to Get It. And it's based on many, many stories, success stories of what's working around the world already, and distillations from those stories of guidelines and lessons and some organizing concepts to put some structure around it so that it's partly just to allow people to put themselves on the map, be able to see where their work is part of a much larger whole, um, partly to address in constructive terms concerns I have for ways this work can go awry. Um, very, I think a lot of what I've been doing the last few months is just spending a huge amount of time in other people's groups, circles, conversations, etc., listening attentively. My undergraduate work is in anthropology, and I feel like I've been doing anthropology because I'm wanting to tune into what people recognize as their concerns, the language they use to frame them what they see as responsive to those concerns that inspires and excites them, et cetera. And my graduate work is in philosophy and ed education, in particular philosophy of higher education. And my background is for 15 years, I oversaw for the community college system of California, it's 102 colleges, curriculum design and approval, especially the infusion of what they called critical thinking, but I really like to think of it as collaborative inquiry, less um, adversarial and more mutual efforts to get at what, as I put it, what do you mean, how do you know, and so what <laughs> kinds of conversations. So at this point, um, I was just invited perhaps to develop a course or several actually I have in mind for Cabrillo College our community college here. Um, today I'm writing a proposal to UCSC, our, our uh, university here, University of Santa, Santa Cruz, California, um, to put, just to get some interns uh, to work with me. Mainly I want to get this body of knowledge and the maps and the models that I have into this website. And as Providence would have it yesterday. Of course, I met a web designer who would love to work with me. <laughs> this was at a small group of the, um, one of the offerings in um, Invisible, whose basic premises I was diverse to from day one, but it really took off as an organizing, a point of departure for people. And they promptly went beyond into, um, in our case, this group is focused on uh, crossing the bridge. They're, they're calling it finding, uh, finding common ground. And so I'm helping them understand the different kinds of conversations, and I'm gonna do a train, develop a training with them on strategic conversations to look at how conversations differ by purposes and processes and so forth. I mean, they're always grounded in good 
the, the council principles, as you were saying, Sarah, and there always have to be grounded in, as I've said, good conversation is always necessary, but rarely sufficient. Um, there's usually something you then have to go to next. So anyhow, I guess lastly, Linda, this will be meaningful to you, I think. Um, it may be you has a nonprofit, and it may be that I'll be able to do this work under the nonprofit in any event. She and I have agreed to work more closely together. And coming back to you in particular, one of the things that people keep bringing up, I'm just so convinced this is something we have to do, is having video clips or short video, maybe 15, as much as a half an hour at times, examples of people engaged in these processes. And we've got all this, we've lists of all these great methodologies and these great processes and opportunities like transpartisan work and so forth. Um, and I'm all excited about it because I'm saying, yeah, you know, if we don't in fact wipe out the human species in the next few decades, we may actually have a chance of creating all this chaos as breakthrough and come out on the other side better able to be human beings with each other. And here's all the things that are happening that suggest that's possible. Well, it would be really nice to have live examples of people engaged in these processes, having these breakthroughs, connecting with each other in new ways, and people be able to see that. So they, they may not have experienced it themselves yet, but they can. it's a little more believable when they see other people going through that. And then we can point, what was it? What was it going on there? What was the container? What were the subtle moves or the framing of the question that opened up that, or the ways people responded to each other that opened up that promise and shifted it in, the direct, in that amazing moment? Okay, I'm gonna stop there. I could probably go on. I could probably talk with you guys for the rest of the day, but we, I'm sure we have other things to do. <laughs> Thank you for your patience and letting me do such a long check-in. Yeah, beautiful. Thanks, Nancy. We haven't heard from you for a long time. It's good to hear from you. So, Rick, we haven't heard from you yet. Yeah, I know. I'm sorry I was late. And I don't know that I'll be with you for the whole call. It's one of those Mondays. It's crazy here. Um, and and not, not in a particularly bad way, just sundry things. We're trying to figure out how to change the, the heating and air conditioning system in our house. We've already changed the hot water. We've changed our car. We're trying to get everything on electric. Wow. We have a contractor showing up. Um, anyway, um, fun buying an electric car. I don't think we've talked about that. What did you get? I got, a Chevy, get I got a Chevy Volt. I bought a GM car. I never thought in my life I'd buy a GM car. The Chevy Volt's fantastic. And by the time you get through in Massachusetts, the incentives, we paid about seventeen, eighteen thousand dollars for it total. Wow, that's great. That's what that's next on my list. I'm doing solar first, and then that's the next thing. Yeah, it's just it's amazing, and it's a great car, and it's so nice to be driving electric. I love it. I just um, got a plug-in. Oh. Yeah, it's a, it's a plug. It's an electric plug-in, but it goes fifty miles or so on the battery before it switches over to a backup desktop. So, anyway. Um, the, my, my, I'm, I'm working with three groups, which is probably too much. <laughs> um, a little bit with the environmental node of the, um, local indivisible group and, uh, got a group in which I, I've talked about before. I got the group going in uh, a local Unitarian church. So they're off and running. We've got about 18 in that group. And then Elders Climate Action with Grady and others is, you know, that's my main focus. Um, and we're making progress. I don't know if I mentioned this. We got a grant this year, a small one, $5,000, but it's very helpful to us because it gives us the ability to do things like begin to plan for materials and so forth. Um, just, uh, I'm sorry? Is that for your elders group? Yes. Yeah. So um, we're working on that. We meet 
we have chapter meeting on Wednesday and stuff like that. So it's coming off the ground. Uh, our outreach effort, you know, I think we've, we've talked about it before. The title is the same as it was when we were together in the fall. Um, what can one person do about climate change? And then we use that as a frame for, um, it's nothing like the kind of dialogue practices that you know, folks here are familiar with because we're trying to basically engage a group of relative strangers with each other in choosing to take some actions. And um, so it's, 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 it's a fairly targeted engagement model. We've been talking to lots of the other groups in, in the climate arena here in New England, um, which has been fascinating, learning from them about what they've learned about engagement. Groups like Mothers Out Front, which you may know, they're, they're just about national at this point, and they've done some great stuff. Very different model of engagement. Um, so that's, that's me, and I'm in. Sorry, I'm, I'm sort of, as always, you know, this, this five o'clock on the East Coast time on a Monday is a challenge for me. It's so. a challenge. <laughs> well, we can always change it. I'm, you know, we're open. Um, so what would someone like to inquire more deeply into or if we, um, really want to be over at three, we've got maybe 15 minutes with a little bit of time to close. Can I respond to a couple of things that Nancy said? Nancy, I just wanted you to know, based on what you were saying about examples of, of biologic practice underway, that around um, the, the council, we filmed um, every session of a reunion that took place last winter, and we made a film out of, we, we um, created a film from that filming and it's all online. So you can go on our, on our website and see the film, which is where I'd start, but it has very much the spirit of the process in it. And I think people really do feel they understand counsel from watching it. And then you can actually sit through the whole damn thing with us in, I think it's 10 different films. <laughs> so I don't think anybody's been doing that, but I wanted them to be available. Um, great, I, great. Yeah. And the other thing I wanted to say was I wondered what people are doing about the climate march, if people are planning to participate in that. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Very much so. Yeah. yeah. yeah I'll be in Tucson and I'm going to be um, sitting at two different desks, one with um, building resilient neighborhoods uh, so that we can let people more people know about that, as well as this 2030 district. So I'm going to go running between those two. But yeah, it's, it's big in Tucson. We have oh. one on the 22nd and one on the 29th. Right. We've got the science one on the 22nd. Yeah. So that's we're, we're participating in both, and we're sending people to Washington, D.C. on the 29th. Yeah. Lovely bus ride. I did want to mention to you, Marty, that uh, I ran into the... Um, Head of the CCL chapter here. We're going to have lunch next week. Uh, she has just stepped down uh, because she feels that she needs to do something else. And so we're going to be just talking in general about climate change work in, um, in Tucson. So more on that later. Okay, great. Well, I am going to, I, we have a science march here that I'll be participating in, a local one. There's, there's five science marches that I could go to in the Bay Area. There's a lot of them, but I'm gonna to go to the most local one in Walnut Creek because I can then do outreach for some of the local campaigns I'm in. But I am going to the Elders Climate Action Conference, Rick, yeah. and, and um, I am going to the March. In D I'll be in DC for a week. Oh, Marty, mm -hmm. I'm going too. So maybe we can get together. Oh, that'd be great. Mm -hmm. Yeah. When do That's you get yeah. into town? Okay. Just give me your rough itinerary. Are you coming in on Friday or before? Or what's Thursday. your life like? Thursday. We'll be in on Thursday. Okay. So let's email. We'll figure it out. Okay, good. That's great. Yeah, and and I, will I, I will be there too, but okay. I don't arrive until Friday night. It's, uh, I'm sorry I won't be there for the meeting on Thursday, but I'll be there on Friday night. Maybe we'll find each other on Saturday somehow. 
great. Yeah, well, Saturday, I don't think we're going to find each other unless we plan it. Um, no. We're but, take, but you're not going to go to the conference? You're not going to the Elders Climate Action Conference, huh? I intended to. They switched the date on me, and by the time I found out, it was too late because I'd blocked in other things. And Okay. So. Do you, I, I was going to ask if you had it. I'm I sorry. I originally thought it was on Monday. It started off being on Monday and then he moved it back to Thursday and it was too late for me to switch other things around. So anyway. I see. Well, I just thought you might have some inside information for me about what to expect. I am kind of excited because they're gonna have a, um, a flash mob, you know, where you, and they're gonna they're gonna do the song, the sing for the climate song, oh, yeah. and they're gonna have a flash mob somewhere. You see. So that's gonna be really fun. I'm I'm pretty excited about um, that experience. I'll be interested. <laughs> and just the community feeling, and just the fun of surprising people and just showing up somewhere and singing for the climate. So that'll be fun. I don't know what time of day. I don't know when they're planning it for, but sometime during that the conference they're gonna do that. Nancy, I did want to say that um, I had a great conversation with Peter Garrett. He's the fellow that's getting those of us uh, who are coming to this London fall dialogue gathering together. And um, he's, uh, you may be interested in this, Sarah, he's, he's developing an academy for people who want to take bone dialogue much more seriously and even get certified like a school and, you know, kind of like a professional academy where he might even try to certify people. I'm not sure all of what he's doing, but that's, that's kind of exciting. And uh, he's going to connect me up with a man in Kentucky, of all places, who's starting some sort of a U.S. academy, some sort of a school. So I'll let you know more as I know more about that. I don't really know. Um, and uh, the interesting thing, Nancy, you brought up about... Um, you know, editing something down on, on, on these videotaped dialogues. Well, I was in a woman's writing group and one of my women said to me just yesterday, well, Linda, I'm seeing you all over the YouTube, I'm seeing you all over YouTube with your, your Zoom dialogues. And I'm like, oh my gosh, because I didn't know how public they were. So now I'm kind of thinking, I really, I need to like curate them more, make them more, you know, like maybe edit them a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> a little scary to think I'm around for you to find me. <laughs> and then, um, actually, Marty, I had a question for you. Can you say a little bit more about your, um, what did you call it, the National in, uh, uh, Environmental Justice? What, what are you doing there? What is that? Um, this is just kind of close to my heart because uh, I'm very what I've gotten increasingly involved in and paying attention to um, in my climate work is the issue of equity and justice in addressing climate change and the fact that the people that have, you know, historically um, been the, on the losing end of being exposed to toxics and all of that are now at risk, you know, of, of being left behind in the solutions to climate change. And so Citizens Climate Lobby has not taken a firm position on equity. And so a small group of us felt that this, we needed to do more work around this. Um, and so the, our, our team is focused on educating within, see, Citizens Climate Lobby is now over 60,000 members. There's about 385 chapters in the United States. And there's another... 200 chapters around the world. We're focused on the United States. We feel like there's not, because about 50 active before. This is the first exposure to activism. This is a very, very white middle class to upper middle class group. Um, and so they're not especially um, sensitized to the experiences of other people and to environmental justice or social justice issues. So our first purpose is to educate within Citizens Climate Lobby as to why issues of environmental justice are need to be tied to any solutions that we have. And then our second goal is to do a listening campaign, which we're doing in outreach to environmental justice groups, anything from the NAACP's Climate Committee to DEMOS to um, 
Sierra Club's client environmental justice group. There are, there's many, many groups that we, we target and work with, but that's really what the focus is. It's really to try to, and, and, you know, citizen, the Citizens Climate Lobby and its solution have been singled out on the left and attacked. So there's also been controversy. So there's, it's just a um, deeper understanding within Citizens Climate Lobby and deeper understanding across this divide between people who live in frontline communities who have their own concerns and people who have big hearts and care deeply about the climate, but that are really probably like most of us, pretty shielded from the immediate impacts of what's going on, where there's other people who are feeling those immediate impacts right now. So. I put us all on mute just to get rid of some of the background noise. You, your uh, video kept freezing up a little bit, Marty, so if you'd like to speak. Oh. You, you, once, once I put everybody on mute, you, the picture came in clear, and I didn't, so probably just lack of bandwidth. Could just be me. Okay. Interesting, interesting work. Um, I uh, just to put it out there. I have any of you heard of uh, the Real News? Paul Ray, I think his name is. Um, I had known about the Real News years ago when I attended the National Media Conference. Gosh, almost ten years ago. Um, it's still around and kicking, and I saw an amazing. Um, it was maybe a forty-five minute. Uh, little podcast off of YouTube. Here, I'll put it on the uh, screen. It was on climate change, and it was one of the best things I've seen. He just did it maybe a, a I'm not sure how long ago, but yes, it was a yeah. called The Real News, and he was saying how the main thing I got out of it is that things are not moving along because the uh, regular corporate news um, I'll put here, it, you, just get, you just go to YouTube, and I think if you Google the real news, Paul Ray, and then climate change, you'll get to it. Um, I thought it was just excellent. It's kind of like, like a summary of where we are, you know, with climate change right now. And the main thing he is uh, a real stickler about is how the media is just not working for us because they're so frightened. I mean, they just have absolutely zero motivation to do anything on climate change. And until that shifts, it's really hard. So, you know, we both have an administration that denies climate change is real, and then we don't even have the fourth estate that's saying anything about it. So I thought it was, it was a little depressing, but it was a good piece that I hadn't seen, you know, before on news. Well, it seems like the media does cover climate change. I'm a little lost. They don't, they don't maybe raise the concern as high high as it should be raised and give it as much of a profile. But right. I mean, I, I read two local newspapers a day and follow a lot of, of course I read Climate Nexus, which is a compilation of climate news. So I'm seeing all the media coverage that's happening. So I, maybe I'm overexposed to selective places, but certainly my two local newspapers, the San Francisco Chronicle and the East Bay Times, you know, there's, I think so I'm, I'm curious as to exactly what, he, what level he's talking about for media coverage. I that isn't necessarily what I would claim the, the, the problem, I, the, the block at. Well, I think he's mainly saying uh, corporate TV, you know, like MSNBC doesn't say a whole lot, Fox doesn't say a whole lot, um, CNN doesn't say a whole lot. I'm not saying they don't TV. say anything. Yeah. They, don't, they don't emphasize it. That's fair. That, that's probably fair. I mean, the New York Times this Sunday had a huge piece um, on what's going on in the, is it the Pearl Delta in China? It was just a huge spread saying that uh, if, if sea level rise goes up, that entire city is going to be underwater. And it's the billions and billions of dollars it's going to cost. So that, that was good. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. And it's kind of sad that the article said, you know, um, looks like China is the only superpower now really taking notice. But, you know, what can they do? <laughs> you know, so I don't know. Yeah, I just wrote a letter to the editor about that today because it was in our local paper too about... Sarah, like you're on mute. I'm going to take you off. You were trying to say something. Yeah, 
Am I there? Yes. I was just saying that I thought those were hopeful articles about the mayors stepping up. You know, the mayors of all the major cities are all on board with their own programs for what they're going to be doing anyway, despite these, you know, jerks at the top. So that's very, very hopeful because they have a lot to say about what's going to be taking place in this country. Yeah, in fact, I, you know, I shouldn't be so negative. I, I had a really good conversation yesterday with a woman from a, she was a friend of a colleague. Um, she is actually, she's a process person. She uh, has been an organization development person most of her career. She's actually running for local office in Spokane because she really feels that people with process skills need to get into politics. It's a very long, very, very uh, satisfying conversation. And uh, I also, because of this work I've been doing with the 2030 district, uh, I took on contacting all of my council people about this, um, this uh, launch party that's coming up on the 20th. So I've been going back and forth with one of the council members and he's doing citizen panels now on a variety of topics. And he's interested in talking to people about possibly doing one on climate change. So that's why it might be interesting, um, Sarah, to talk with you, because if I did something like that, it'd be nice to then launch some other ongoing program, because I'm not too much into one-off events these days. But anyways, you know, I'm beginning to get little, little inroads. Yeah. Well, Linda, I'd like to know more about the citizen panels. Is that in Tucson? In Tucson. He's doing... mm -hmm. Wow. Yeah, he really feels that with everything going on um, in D.C., not in a positive way, uh, that we need more citizen engagement on a variety of local issues, with climate change possibly being one of them. So yeah. I'm, feeling, I, I'm feeling I can be a lot more effective in that way than I, I was on the, on the commission, because the commission was just... It's too constrained politically. I, I know now that Tucson, the city itself, is pretty bankrupt and they really don't want any suggestions that are going to cost it any money. So I don't need to be wasting my time there. Yeah. Yeah. So any last questions or queries? Jim, are you going to show us your alien? Actually I do have, well, I don't want to, no, I don't want to, I do want to see the alien, but I also want to make, you know, we're, we're essentially out of time. I maybe should do that another time. Well, if you could just share your screen quickly, it might be a nice place to end. No, I don't mean that. I meant what I was going to say. Go ahead. Are you on mute? Here, you're off mute. Um, I'm just going to note that in talking with people about finding common ground, I've said, well, the common ground is underground, meaning there's the issues that have been predefined for us and used to win elections and to promote devi divisiveness across the country. And we have somehow bought into wrapping our whole identities around these things underneath and driving it are these really, really big questions for which none of us has answers. It's not a matter of convincing each other. We, the idea of that most people can probably immediately relate to in that context is our economic future. Where are the jobs going to come from? What are they going to look like? And if you open a conversation as um, I think Tim Bonneman is working with um, an organization in uh, West Virginia or South Carolina in a county by county conversation on our economic future. And I find that is a wonderfully neutral way to open a conversation behind which you can bring in an awful lot about climate change, about resilience, about creating resilient communities, you can bring in worker-owned businesses and co-ops and the sorts of things that are happening in Cincinnati and the idea of not waiting for jobs to come to us, but creating jobs in response to what's needed and to opportunities in solar and energy shifts and infrastructure change and so forth, which can get to 
very substantial issues in ways that are not inherently controversial. People don't have to buy into our version of the problems up front because we're starting with the things they already feel viscerally are problems, but they're in fact, you dig down and they're tied in with these issues anyhow. And the other thing I'll note was at the CCL meeting on Saturday, um, our little, we have now 230 people in our chapter and it is like, that's all happened within the past six months. And we just went, had a reorganizing meeting and are setting up teams and I'm trying to get them to not be just laser focused. So I was really identifying with what you were saying, Marty. But in any event, they had an assistant secretary of the Navy on as their resource person this past Saturday. And she talked about the language she uses in the military to convince them to deal with climate change. And the word resilience keeps surfacing. Remember a year and a half ago, I kept pushing using the word resilience. I kept talking about it because it's something that gets at climate justice. It gets at caring about each other. It gets at how do we keep communities going even in the face, even if the community has to relocate, etc. So I'm feeling some encouragement that reaching out to middle America and blue collar workers and so forth that so urgently needs to be done, could be done in a way that is newly energized by what's happening. And finally, I'm just so blown away by what an amazing, how, how Donald Trump really is making America great again. <laughs> He has single-handedly created the most powerful, potentially powerful movement across this country of anything I've seen in my life. I mean, even beyond the 60s. So um, being forced to deal with these issues at the state level and the community level and reach across to China. You want to ask me what China can do? I'll be happy to tell you based on my experience there the last few years. <laughs> um, it's actually just remarkable. And I've even been getting pushback that even Trump supporters are saying, wait a minute, climate is an issue. We didn't, we didn't bring you in here to get rid of climate. That's a bigger and bigger problem for us. So that was much longer than the one minute I promised. We're now five minutes after. Okay, sorry. It's all right, Nancy. I did want to just say, I wrote it over here. Um, I've been contacted by this group called the Resilience Dialogues. I'm wondering if any of you have heard of them. Mm -mm. Sounds good. Well, they're doing, um, what, they, what they're doing is they're choosing certain communities. Um, they're going to talk to me sometime next week. Um, we don't have an appointment yet, but they said, is Tucson wanting something called a Resilience Dialogue, where we come in and we help communities look at where they're vulnerable to climate change. So I want to see what they do. I don't totally understand it yet, but I was curious if any of you had heard of them. I think they got a hold of me through NCDD. And uh, anyways, I'll let you know more when I know. But uh, it sounds like it could be, could be something. I've been looking for ways, as I think some of you know, to get the uh, key players in Tucson all on the same page kind of moving forward and so you know if it took like a outside well-funded agency that's fine with me shall we just do maybe a final round or is, or is there something else we anyone wants to bring up I just have a couple, as I close out, I just have a couple of uh, resource comments kind of on the thread we're on right, right now, um, which is that in the Bay Area, the city of Richmond is, has a group now that's working on um, resilience transition planning for a just transition. So they're really trying to get granular and look at really what it would look like on the ground. And, and Richmond, California is a fossil fuel town. It's got Chevron you know, refineries there, the biggest refineries in the state for Chevron oil. And um, I'm very interested in that for the whole Contra Costa County area to really have a, a, more of a vision on 
what does our future look like when it's clean and renewable? And to that point, I don't know whether any of you know about the Post Carbon Institute, Richard Heinberg's oh, yeah. organization, but I just learned about a course that he's beta testing right now on resilience and planning for the future. And you can download for free the course curriculum and take it at your own speed. Um, and I, I, we've all missed the opportunity to be part of the actual beta cluster, which is more of a collaborative learning experience around the course materials with him. <laughs> What's the course called again? Um, I, can, I don't have the, you can find it right at Post Carbon Institute, um, the details on it. I, could, I can look it up and get, get more specific detail. But for any of you that are looking, you might just want to prowl around there and see if there's any resources there that are helpful. He just published a new book. I'm very interested in trying to visualize in more concrete terms exactly what this next phase is going to really look like. Um, and he's done a lot of um, thinking on that. That's great. All right, he was the first guy that got me into this. Rick? Rick, you may be on mute. I took you off. You're good now. Yeah. Um, uh, to Marty's point, I'd be interested in knowing more about that. The Post Carbon Institute is a, a member of uh, our Elders Climate Chapter here. He's been working hard. He's he's an MIT engineer, and he's been working hard from the technology point of view of saying how do we get to, in his view, eighty uh, percent. You know, the clean. Uh, economy uh, because that's all of the technology that he can see but it, Massachusetts like California has a global warming solutions act that mandates that the state keep hit these various goals over the next you know sort of every five or ten years the question is um, what do they think they're going to do so we're trying to match up the legislative act with what the science and the engineering says, and that's one of the things he's working on. Um, you know, it's like there's, there's, some, there's some known facts and there's some other things that are, are close to true, and they need to be sort of organized in a way that policymakers can work with them. Like, are we on track? It's 2022. Well, yeah, you met your goal, but you did it just by removing coal power plants and putting them on gas. That's not going to get you to 2035's goal. What are you going to do now? You know, so it's that kind of thinking. Mm -hmm. Anyway, so I'd be interested in seeing more about that. Thank you. I guess there's one other thing that is kind of interesting, should this ever be of interest to any of you. Uh, do any of you know this guy, Tom Greco? He's written uh, three or four books on alternative currencies. Anyways, he lives in Tucson. Um, he's actually who helped me meet my current partner. I've known him for all, almost 10 years since I've been here. Uh, he was very involved with Sustainable Tucson when I was working with them. Anyways, he has come up with a new white paper that's on his website uh, about working with the utility companies in one's area to create an alternative currency, and he calls it solar dollars. Um, if any of you are interested, I can send you the, uh, the link to his website. It's an interesting idea. Uh, there's a group now that's going to form in Tucson to see if they can take his idea forward. It would bring more liquidity to a utility company. Uh, they could launch the solar dollar alternative currency, pay their, uh, their solar-based vendors this currency, and then they can redeem it, and it gets out into the economy, of course, and so there's more turnover. So it does add liquidity to the economy. And the ultimate payback, of course, is that uh, the utility company has to accept it for one's utility bills. So it's a way to promote solar, renewables, add liquidity into a local economy, um, and just bring more attention to renewables. So it's an interesting idea if any of you have any desire to look into something like that. Yeah, send it out. I would. I would like to. Linda, I'm going to need to seg out here. It must go 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 so it all seg out. Are we ready or not? Do you think? Because otherwise, I'll slip away. Okay. Um, 
I think we're probably good. Is it does it want to stay on? Um, I'm I'm fine for about another half hour, and then I'm going to have to slip away too. Well, yeah. Good. Then let me leave. And thank you all very much. And thank Marty, I'll get in touch and see if we email. Let's email and see if we can hook up in DC. That would be great. Okay. Great. okay. It's it's all right. Okay. Thank you all. See you. Bye bye. Bye bye. And I'm I'm leaving too. And Marty, I will see if we can find a way to connect. Yeah, that would be good. Okay. Hi, Rick. Thank you all. Bye. 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 So, did you add some things? Uh, I just have one other thing for Jim. Yes. <clears throat> Go ahead, Mark. I, I don't know that gonna, there's going to be an event in the Bay Area with Joanna Macy. And uh, I don't know whether she'll be speaking at all. I don't know whether with at her age is she's actively doing any of the active hope work or not. Or she has is. it really been taken over by others? No, she, she is. She is. Okay. And uh, <clears throat> we had a session in Massachusetts uh, in September. And she was there for almost a week teaching. Oh, great. Yeah. Okay. It's amazing she's okay. still going strong. She must be close to 90, if not already 90. That's true. I love her work. Absolutely love her work. I so wish I had done more with it. I actually took her facilitator training, but... You did? Uh-huh. I did. Oh. Yeah, well, I, I want to know how to find the information Jim had on her training. It may not be what I need to do right now, but I'd like to know what you were talking about, Jim. Well, I was... Just... So I don't know that it's here. Jim, you didn't oh, add your, your references. I would love you to add your references. I just barely got some of them down. Yeah, I, I, I can't remember how to do that. Uh, what, what do I do? Well, do you see right next to the Zoom uh, screen, there's a white board? You have to move your um, Zoom over. Move my... Move your Zoom sure, sir. to the right. I, I don't have anything that says Zoom. <laughs> Okay. okay, I'm going to split my screen and show you what I'm doing. So hold okay. on. Oh, okay. So you should see my, my screen. Yeah, and I do. I've been taking notes while some of you have been talking. Yeah. I'm trying to capture some of it. Uh, let's see if I can move it over a little bit. Uh, so right okay. here I said Dan Siegel's Wheel of Awareness, a good a good tool that will McWinney's work on passive change different right. world. so what you need to do um, Jim is move your you'll you you probably see um, some of us over on the side so when I stop sharing the screen what you what you can do is take your cursor see my cursor right there kind of straddles wait, wait I don't see your cursor sorry here's my cursor okay okay see how I can put it at the very edge of my screen yeah. And I can move it over, make it yes. smaller. Okay, so you can do that to both the Zoom screen as well as this screen. And oh, I you, see. Can put the, you can put them side by side, and that way you can take notes on the shared screen. I get it, sort of, yeah. I'll stop sharing my screen. So okay. you can maybe play with that a little bit. I will. Well, if Jim has something to mail out, like a PDF or something else, I think he said he mailed something to you, Linda, on the on the curriculum, <laughs> on the joint curriculum. Yeah, it was the uh, facilitator competencies for the work that reconnects. Oh, a three page. So you you sent that to me, Jim? I did uh, around ten of ten minutes before we started. Okay, well then I'll just mail that on to everybody. Okay. Okay, great, great. Okay, well, any final checkouts? Well, I'm overwhelmed by uh, the fabulous people on this phone call. <laughs> I am, yourself, really. Yourself being one of them, of course. Yeah, and I, I was very pleased that Sarah reminded us relationships come before problem solving. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, 
I took that course and, and I forgot that, but that's typical. Yeah. Yeah, so I always get excited getting ready here, so. Right, well, you bring so much to share, but we really do need to start with our personal check-ins. I, yeah. I feel like I'm... I'm I feel like I've been so negative today. I think I'm just in a, oh, I don't know, just tired, tired. And I don't, I don't see a clear road forward. I see all these little funny things I'm doing that I don't see, I don't see the path. <laughs> I want to see the path. <laughs> Seems like we're all doing uh, what we can though, which is probably we're all. We're trying, we're trying. We're trying, yeah, I'm trying to hold it together. And it is true, what it's, whatever somebody said, Nancy, I think it was you, that the gift really is Trump in that he's, he's just, you know, he's just created all of this energy, this, this new awakening that everyone <laughs> has in my sphere, you know, trying to make sense of it all. So hopefully we'll look back on this time of great craziness and say, you know, thank you. Thank you, Donald Trump. <laughs> Yeah, we'll see. Yeah, Marty, I'd love to hear a little more about your thoughts about the, um, the internal education to CCL. It was partly thanks to our phone calls many months back now that I first got involved with CCL, and it's ended up being something I'm pretty involved with here. And I feel like it has more potential than it is realizing as well as having the limitations you were talking about. So I'd, if you have a few more thoughts on that. <clears throat> yeah, well, I mean, CCL is a very interesting organization and with, a, with many top-down features, but also just a, a tremendously lib empowered grassroots. So a lot of the amazing things that happen through Citizens Climate Lobby happen just because somebody in CCL says, I have an idea and I'm going to just do it. So, right, right. So that, that's really the part of the or DNA of the organization is that's how things happen. And that's basically how this environmental justice action happened. I think over the last year, there's been more and more CCLers are finding each other who have felt that there's been um, a blind spot in how CCL looks at the left, how it looks at the Democrats, and how it looks at the climate movement, and that its obsession with getting Republicans, which is very well founded, has really been an unbalance. So there's another initiative called the Progressive Team that's trying to do some similar work. So there's just people, you know, people in CCL find each other, like the team I'm on is a national team. So I'm working with people in Michigan, Illinois, um, on this environmental justice work in DC. So the more you get into CCL and CCL community, you find people through these different networks and you realize going to the conferences really helps that as well. Um, the, the June conference will probably is an amazing networking opportunity for meeting people that are like-minded. So, so that's kind of, kind of the general way of how it works, but. What's some of your sense of, and you may not be there yet, uh, but what are some of the changes or a, where would you like, what would you like to see happen within CCL itself as a result, if the work that you're opening up with this group were to start having an impact, what might that look like? Well, I, that's a longer conversation, but I do think, I mean, we're trying to, we're, people within CCO would be um, much less likely to say stupid things to people that are in the climate movement um, out of their own heartfelt zeal and their ignorance about other strategies because CCL doesn't automatically educate people about the incredible breadth of concerns, worldviews, um, actions that motivate people to get involved in trying to address climate change. It's, it's, 
so people make blunders and that's part of the reason that we've had problems. So I would like to see people much more educated and appreciative of and humble maybe about the fact that there's many other things that are extremely important that are going on in addition to what CCL does. Um, and then on the ground, I just think having really robust, respectful relationships with other people that are working on other local solutions um, to at least keep the dialogue open because there's many people do not agree with CCL solution that, that are very committed to climate change solutions and they do not believe in the dividend or even some people on the left don't even think we should be pricing carbon, which is a little crazy to me, but that's what Food and Water Watch says. <laughs> you know, we don't want anything to do with carbon markets. So it's a crazy environment, and so but we need to build relationships and um, have dialogue. I just had a, I just did a presentation last Sunday to a, 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 an alliance of environmental justice groups, mainly groups that act as allies to frontline communities in the Bay Area, and it, it went really well. But it was really trying out a different way to tell CCL's story to to peers, and I don't think CCL has a model that. Some of our audience are people in other sectors, and some of our audience are our peers who are working in different lanes in the climate movement. And when we talk to our peers, we have to talk with respect for the fact that they have obviously chosen a different way to make a difference in this movement, and we have to validate that. Sincerely, not just as window dressing, but sincerely validate it. Which brings me to my last point, which is, probably the majority of CCL people should not be doing environmental justice outreach. You should only do it if you're called to it and if it's part of your life. It's like trying to work with Republicans. I, you know, we have now 15% of CCLers are Republicans. They're the ones that really have to do the majority of the, the, the business outreach. You know, it's really uh, the outreach to hardcore Republicans. It's really hard as we know, if you're not a member of an identity group, you're seen as the outsider by them. And so if we're talking about hearts and minds, if you're, a, if you're not a part of a group for you to go to them and try to shift their attitudes or opinions, and you're not seen as part of them, you have a much harder time. So part of that is just telling CCL is, you know, don't, you don't have to outreach to these groups. There's other people in CCL who are already part of those groups who can do the best outreach to them because they already have membership membership in those groups. Does that make sense? Every bit of it makes perfect sense. And it, it kind of validates as, as this relatively small group suddenly exploded in size and decided uh, the last couple of weeks to a small group of us to meet and reorganize it. And I stepped in and said, I would help create a team focused on, um, strategic alliances and mm. precisely the reason I picked that one was because it was the one place where many of the, the issues you've just listed very nicely could be picked up on in a way that made sense to the CCL core didn't directly threaten their laser focus as they like to call it but opened up a space to start having these kinds of conversations so Phenomenal, and I, I'd yeah, love. That's really to, a conversation. I'd love to maybe know a little bit more. I don't know how much I could participate, but um, happy to maybe listen at least to some of the conversations around this and think about uh, both aspects of what you're saying: the ability to work within the divisions between the left and CCL and look in particular at frontline impacts and, and also looking a lot more closely at adaptation with issues, which are a lot of the frontline issues are adaptation issues, as along with the, the mitigation strategies that may, may differ, also may differ from there. So anyhow, thank you very much. That was really helpful. Good. That's I feel much encouraged actually, since I'm still a newbie and I understand the issues, just having heard you describe them. I was saying, oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, that's what's going on. Yeah, that makes sense. Thank you. Do you know Linda 
Moran? Do you know Linda? Yes, uh, she is. Probably that's who I know, know best in the the leader in our uh, community here. Absolutely. Uh, Marty, I, that brings up this one random thing I wanted to ask you. Uh, in working with that software developer, he wanted to know from an activist point of view, you know, give me an example. So what I did, I jumped on CCL's, I think it was CCL. Yeah, it was on CCL's uh, website. And I noticed that there were 17 Republicans who come together in some kind of climate office. Have you seen that? So oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. It's big news. That's yeah. big news. Yeah. So is, is yeah, that that's the climate leader. Has CCL helped that group? I mean, come together? Well, yeah. The, I mean, George Schultz is on our advisory board, and we've worked with George Schultz for two years. Okay. We've worked with Greg Mankiw. Um, so, I mean, and CCL's helped create the, the environment. Our marching orders from the top, and I don't disagree with it, is that we're not supposed to lay claim to any of it publicly. We really have to let the Republicans have their moment in the sunshine. Um, if you go on their website, they list us as a partner. Or the Republicans climate change resolution, where we had direct roles in making those things happen and we can talk about them. The dots are less clear for this climate leadership council, but, but definitely CCL was part of the context and environment that made it possible for a group like that to, to, that's my opinion. We're not allowed to really say that officially because again, we have to, you know, CCL is really wants Republicans to get all the glory, just get your butt moving and make it happen right now. We'll shut up. We don't need to say anything, but just get your act together and pass a bill. <laughs> so you're on mute. Doing that because for some reason, um, you got to leave. Jim, are you leaving? Oh, wait, I'm sorry. I put, I put everybody on mute. I'm so sorry. Okay, everyone's off mute. I did that because when Marty talks, for some reason, it comes out clear if everyone's on mute. Mm -hmm. Are you needing to leave, Rick? I mean, Jim? Yeah, I do. Yeah. Okay. I, I really love today's event. Thank yeah. you. Thanks but for Jim, being here. Jim, Jim, we didn't get to see the alien yet. Well, I have no idea. I have the picture right here, but I don't know how to send it to you. No, you don't send it. You just share your screen. You take your cursor to the bottom of the screen where it says share screen. Share screen. Wait a minute. I'll try it. The oh. alien is so bountiful. As long sure. as it's on your computer, just put yeah. it, click share screen and then go up and click on click on the uh, the part of your screen that you want us to see, and then at the then at the bottom you'll see share screen again. You have to click up on so that. that be, uh, select a window or an application you want to share. Yeah, and then, and then go down to the um, the bottom of the the zoom screen. You'll see share screen again. You have to click it again. Okay, I, I, I can't drop the picture into that. No, you don't drop it. Just go down and hit the very bottom of the Zoom screen where it says share screen again. Okay. There you go. There okay, you go. Now, now what do I do? Now you click on the picture you'd like us to see on your screen. Okay. And it should come up. That's it. Hey, all right. <laughs> Great. It's my granddaughter. <laughs> Wow. wow, nice. Very nice. Very There's nice. a likeness too in her cheeks. I love yeah, it. Yeah, so it's a project of the Kiwanis Club in town. <laughs> that's great. Well, I'm yeah. glad I saw the alien. Okay, that's him. Okay, For her. great. Okay. And now, Jim, you need to go up and stop sharing your screen, and then you can then you can go. Otherwise, you'll you'll be leaving us in your screen. Okay. Let's see. Stop. Pause. Stop at the top. Hey, stop share, I see. Okay, got it. All right. Thanks, Jeff. Oh, <laughs> go viral. Okay, now we'll let you go. <laughs> Thank you so much. All right. Be careful. Nancy, you're terrific. Right. Marty, you're terrific. Bye -bye. You're terrific. <laughs> bye bye.
Okay. Seemed like there's one other thing I wanted to say. Oh, just that when you say you go out in a Marty and talk like that to another um, environmental justice group, you must talk about what CCL does, right? And then your intention is to kind of, like, like, what's your end, your action item? Like, do you say, come on over and join CCL? Or do you, like, how do you, how do you win? The purpose was just to explain, the context was, that this group knew that CCL and the policy was getting trashed a lot on the left and they didn't understand why. So they wanted me to come in and talk about it more deeply because they'd never really been exposed to all the pieces of it. So it was basically just telling the story of um, what carbon fee and dividend is and how it works and why we think it's a good solution and why we think it's an equitable, fair, progressive solution and um, and then some of how CCL works, which, I mean, it was really fun for me to do because I had to reframe a lot of how I told things. Um, which group were not, you? Not, this wasn't manipulative, but it was just, it was just fun. It was reframing it like I'm talking to my my left tribe that I belong to about my CCL work, which is, you know, basically not seen as a very left thing at all. So I'm decoding it for them. It's basically what I was doing. Why so I was decoding. Saying, why, are you, why, are you, why are you saying it's not seen as a left-based thing anymore? What were some of the things you said? Well, I'd really be interested to hear the language, some of the reframing. Yeah, I'm trying to think of some of it. Um, well, I mean, just saying that, you know, explaining, I mean, this is, these are just little things that are coming to my head, but, you know, explaining to them how I cringe when I go on the CCL website, because the floating pictures are all Republicans. And I say, you know, I cringe when I see that, because I know any of my progressive friends that would come onto this website to learn about CCL and learn about this policy are immediately going to have a hit that says, this is not us. What is this thing? I don't trust this thing. These are all Republicans here. So, th so saying things like that and saying how, um, you know, it, how, you know, that, that I believe this is a policy that has wins for both the left and the right, but CCL focuses a lot on learning how to talk Republican. So a lot of our language that they're probably hearing elsewhere is very Republican language, market solution. Um, revenue neutral, which is a big code word for Republicans. Democrats hate revenue neutral. Democrats want, you know, so kind of decoding all this for them and saying, you know, you're hearing these things because you have to understand we're trying to stand in the middle, totally nonpartisan, and we're trying to be able to talk a language that can sway the Republican. And so it doesn't sell real well on the left, that language. But I can translate that language for you and tell you how this policy works from a left point of view. So it's that kind of stuff. I was just basically decoding it and deconstructing it for them. And I think because I, I'm active in this alliance, I've delivered for them some, th some things for their campaigns. I really was a trusted messenger. Yeah. That, and people said in the room, you've, I've really, my, my views are shifted. And people said, I've heard CCL before and, well, I've always had huge problems with it, but I, I'm, I kind of get it now, you know? So well, thank you for that, because I, I mean, I've always thought it was a left organization, but trying to grab as many people on the right as they could. And so that's why they're well, I mean, language, right? Exactly. Well, I said we're 85% we're right, left, Democrat, ind independent, um, progressive, and even we have socialists. Yeah, because one of the guys on my environmental justice team is actually a socialist. And I said, that's who we are. Yeah. We're 15% Republican, but that's not how we're perceived by many on the left. Yeah, so it was just telling them things like that. But the typical CCL presentation does not frame things. It would not make any sense to talk about these things. But again, this is why it's so important with the audience on the left that you know your audience well and that you... I couldn't do this to a group of people that didn't know me on the left. Right. I would, I would probably 
soften it quite a bit, but this group knows me. And so it was really kind of a very frank um, so, discussion of, of so what I, it is. And we were putting CCL down. I mean, I really spoke very strongly about all our accomplishments and, and what we want, but it was really decoding it for them so they could get it. So I have one big question. Do you see CCL ever um, expanding out of or beyond just the fee and dividend? Not until the bill's passed. So it's just a single issue group of people right now. Yeah, and the way I, again, the way I see this, and this is back to Nancy's point. Um, is Nancy still here? Yeah, that, that um, you know, I have chosen, I mean, I've been involved with CCL now almost five years, and, but it's only one thing I do. I am not defined in the climate movement by CCL. So, I mean, I, in this talk, I said, well, when I wear my CCL hat, I talk this way and I show up a certain way. But I do many other things because I believe we need to be doing many things to make a, a difference. I think many people in CCL don't just do CCL. And the thing I think CCL has to do a better job of is acknowledging and giving permission to people right. to act in other ways. It's just that when you're CCL, this is all you do. That doesn't mean this is all you should do. Right, right, right. Um, but but when, you're, when you're showing up as a CCL person, this is all your, this is the only thing we take a position on. We're totally, right. we already take a position on it. I'm, I'm pushing it now to have them, I'm sorry, Nancy, go on. Well, <laughs> finish out your thought you're pushing now to, and then I have well, a just a now, quick. I, there's some, I mean, CCL just came out with some principles, and I have to say, I'm not real happy with them, but, um, and I had sent up the food chain a couple months ago some some environmental justice messaging points that I wanted CCL to adopt as an organization and I haven't gotten feedback on those yet hmm. um, so I'm you know so I am kind of a, a little bit of a pushy change agent in CCL I and I've been around long enough I know the people but I, just but I don't you know, I don't think we're necessarily going to win on it. I just Did you see the values? Let me let me um, ask you first of all to send me the the other talking points on the principles that you just mentioned. Okay. I would like to see those. Secondly, although I haven't seen it acknowledged as such in my mind, I do think that their effort to build out the Congressional uh, Climate Solutions Caucus is the other thing they're actively doing. I mean, they're actively doing it in, as they see it in support of their specific policy. You know, policy. But part of the appeal, and one of the reasons I keep emphasizing it, is it actually has potential for being a whole lot broader because you know, a, a Climate Solutions Caucus could look at, would be a place to carry other solutions at the national level, at the, at the congressional that's level. Good. So that's, that's definitely the thing that gets me excited. Yeah, I've noticed that, really good. and there's a lot of people who are skeptical, it, skeptical of the fee and dividend, but will sign on with, oh yeah, I'll support the idea of us having a congressional uh, climate solutions caucus. Yeah, we sure do need that. That's and it's you know the other last thing yeah. I, I'm yeah. curious yeah. about is well, I guess I'd like, as I said, to be part of some of the conversations and look at how to influence either influence CCL at the main level, the, at the top level, since it is so top level, or continue to find ways to network with other CCLers throughout the country at the local levels who are obviously free to do whatever they want, whether they're wearing, I mean, they can take their CCL hat off or they can leave it on and say, well, this is CCL, but part of what we're doing or he, what we're doing here or what we realize needs to be done or something that um, 
helps to do exactly what you're doing to explain it mm -hmm. to explain it where it's a matter of misunderstanding and to tr and to commit to trying to modify it where they're not quite on base are you on your community? Let, let me go to mute again because for some reason you're you yeah, keep you freezing. Talk, it's hard to hear you i'm not coming in well are you on ccl community uh, not actively yet but i will get myself on there that's your place to network that's okay and is that where your group your environmental justice group there is? is an environmental justice thread there that you should join yeah and is that where you guys are having your conversations or well, is it something else? My thought is that that's not really an open for you know just chiming in it's really only people that are doing the work there's a very small team that has calls that i don't think it'd be appropriate for you to be on that given what you're describing you are doing right now but being in the ccl community the environmental justice community thread would be a good place to well, start. well marty you and i would need to have a bigger conversation before you made that decision because i didn't even begin to tell okay. you that i'm doing i told you okay. as it was i took too, too much time for a check and you have no idea what i'm doing <laughs> with all okay, that's, okay. i stand corrected okay. you got me I'm right. you're right so I need to I need to scoot. I've got an appointment. Um, I'm going to stop recording, but you two can stay on if you'd like. Um, so I should really. I'm way beyond. I, I was going to only stay yeah, on for. And I've got a dead, deadline. I'm trying to meet today. Yeah.